On behalf of the students in sociology of incarceration, welcome to Harlem Community College. Over the past few weeks, we have been examining various aspects of incarceration. We have been able to tour our local, our local county jail and youth detention facility. In addition, due to last innovative grant funds, bring amazing speakers to campus. Not only does this assist in our learning experience, but it benefits the community members who can also attend. Our special guest today is a true te testament to the power of change. We are not our mistakes. It is what we learn from those mistakes that truly matters. We all have the ability to overcome our pasts. Ronaldo Hudson is an educator, minister, and a community organizer, and he focuses his work on ending perpetual punishment in Illinois. During 37 years of incarceration, Hudson in the Illinois Department of Corrections, where he became a leader, educator, and founder. Hudson developed and implemented groundbreaking programs inside the Department of Corrections, including the prison newspaper State Still Speaks and the Building Blocks program, a transformational program run by incarcerated people. Hudson's work and life have been featured in media outlets, including the BBC, Chicago Tributes, Chicago Magazine, and others. His story and work to create back-ending mechanisms for the release of incarcerated people is a subject of the documentary State Civil Calling. He was released in September 2020 when Governor Pritzker commuted his life sentence and joined the IPP as a director of the education later that year. Ronaldo currently serves as a U Chicago Arts of the People. Please help me welcome to the stage Ronaldo Hudson. <laughs> Hello, man. Hello, everyone. Y'all see these, can y'all see these shoes? Yeah? There, I'm the only one on the earth, on the whole earth with these IPP shoes. But I'm looking out here and I see the Illinois Prison Project t-shirts, so I'm excited that you are, what's up, bro? You cool? Huh? You in college? Huh? Somebody take his picture. Because oftentimes what we have a tendency to see is the worst of us and not the best of us. And you're looking good. And I just want to acknowledge that, man. Like, I love the fact that I can look out here and see you. I see the rest of y'all, and y'all expect it to be like y'all expect it to be in school. You're expected to succeed, right? But I'm that guy that lived with hope. I'm that guy that I know despite all the different things that can happen, right? It, you have to be able to fight through it. And I am a professional, and I'm gonna give y'all this, and don't y'all try to use this, but I'm gonna share it with y'all. I am a professional flusher. Y'all know how y'all have that special moment where you have to release an experience? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Does it, does it smell bad? That's what I'm talking about. Life has a tendency to call upon us to release stuff it no longer wants to hold. And if you don't flush, what happens? Get backed up, right? And it starts to smell. The same thing happens with life decisions, right? I made a horrible decision over 30 plus years ago. I know I don't look like it. I'm really handsome. I, mean, I want to make sure y'all get a... Right? I keep telling people, like, you need to own who you are. You need to recognize the fact that I'm a believer that believes that I am fearfully and wonderfully made by God. That does not mean that we won't make bad decisions. I did not make a mistake, little sister. I made a bad decision over 37 years ago. And I think it's important when we start talking about criminal justice reform and prison reform that we first ask a question that I want you all to ponder, which is, it is easy to talk about the innocent. They should be exonerated. They didn't do it. That's an easy conversation. 
But my question is, what do we as sober people owe to the guilty? As a society, do you owe anything to the guilty? I will say absolutely. If you're using language like justice, justice consists of across the board that the whole story is told. Oftentimes, people get what I call locked in time warps or capsules, right? Like when I went to prison, and I'm going to be jumping around, so I'm gonna hope, I hope y'all put y'all seatbelt on. I went to prison. How many young people in how many people in here was born in 83 or not born in 83? Would you raise your hand? You weren't born yet, like in the 80s. I really, I do this intentionally, right? The reason, because some of us, like I was born in 1964 in the colored section of the Cook County Hospital. It was a stormy Tuesday, by the way, right? The reason I know that is I did the research and I wanted to know what was going on in America in 1964 and why were you, what made you special, Ronaldo? I'm telling y'all, I can't say this enough and I hope to, especially to the young people, you better know that you're special. You better know that no matter what you face, right, drop as many balls as you have to until you catch one, right? But never stop fighting to be better. Never stop believing in yourself because the world will throw enough stuff on you. I'm the physical manifestation of resilience. And I say that not to boast, but only to acknowledge the fact that if you don't acknowledge that despite decisions you make, you can be better than your worst decision. And I say that because the organization that I work for as the director of education, I am so proud to say they no longer call me BO2995. They no, they no longer call me offender, right? They no longer call me inmate. They call me director Hudson of education. Yeah, thank you, right? Because I think that's important. You know, some people get wrapped up and they think, well, you know, I don't really care about titles. But I'm going to give y'all a little history, like a little. Let me tell you something what titles do. Titles open doors, right? When I call and they say the director of education, I call the Department of Correction now. Check this out. And I get to mess with them. <laughs> like they used to tell me, line up, shut up, go to child day room, I now call them and say, hey, what's going on in Pontiac? What are the guys doing? Why aren't, why aren't people in school? What's going on with COVID? What's going on with this? What's going on with that? How about the grievance process, right? Are you giving people an opportunity to own their stuff? Because oftentimes people talk about the fact that those guys never or those people never own their stuff. I'm here to tell you that we live in a society where we're forced to be adversarial. Because the first thing they told me when I was arrested in 1983, you have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney. If you can't afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you, right? Then, as soon as I walk in the courtroom, the state's attorney says, they won't show any remorse. I was told to shut up by my lawyer. When I, from the moment of my arrest, me, this person, I own the fact that I made a horrible decision. But to give some picture to, let me show you what's important. When people talk about trauma, they say those are excuses. It is not an excuse to talk about the fact that at the age of six, I was born to a set of twins. My twin brother name is Ronald. At the age of six, he was kicked down a flight of stairs by my stepbrother. That is the story that I was told. I don't remember the details. I just know I've never saw my twin again. In fact, when I came home in 2020, I did not have any identification. And so I had been uh, looking at my name, Ronaldo Hudson. And so when I sought to get my social security number to get, like, to all the stuff you have to get to, you know, process getting back into the world. Like, 
And they was like, we don't know you. You don't exist. I'm like, I don't exist? Yes, I do. I'm like, like they've been counting me for years. Like, I know I exist. Because every day, three times a day, they would count Renault One. I'm, I exist. Who am I? And so what I discovered through this investigation is that my name legally is actually Ronaldo Turner. Right? And so I had to go to almost 60 days of investigation, had to go down to the Social Security office, and was sworn in. I'm like, why am I raising my hand? What did I do? Wait a minute. Like, I didn't do nothing. But I didn't know that the Social Security officers are officers, federal officers. And if you lie to them, it is a potential charge. I'm like, whoa, that's something that people don't really talk about. And I went in, and I'm going into that to make the point is, so I had to reacclimate myself to the world, right? And I had to like be reintroduced. And then I discovered that there's no record of my twin, right? And I'm like, dang, right? I know Ronald exists. I know that I wasn't hallucinating, even though the years before my arrest, I began to use drugs. And so I'm not someone, once again, I'm really big on accountability and responsibility. But I think that we have to stop using what I think is really warped language. Well, let's talk about second chances. Like, let's talk about rehabilitation. I am a believer in fair chances, not second chances. Because when you get into that matrix, what happens is you Im imply that someone had a chance in the first place. When people talk about rehabilitation to me, I remind them of something really simplistic. How can you rehabilitate someone who was never habilitated in the first place? You're saying you're going to take me back to something that I never had access to? So how about, let's use language that's more important. How about redemption? Y'all know that language? Y'all familiar with that word? How about, like, we start figuring out what does redemption look like? I, am, I have to confess, I am somewhat of a Bible scholar, and so I say that intentionally so I may quote a scripture or two, and it's not to offend anyone's uh, belief one way or the other, but I tend to share my faith because through my, in, my experience of incarceration, it was my faith that sustained me. It was my faith when the Bible said to Ronaldo, if you turn from your wicked ways and your unrighteous thoughts, I will show you the sure mercies of David, and I will abundantly pardon you. And so I'm like, what does that mean? So I went and studied this character, David. And so you can hear sermons of people talking about David was a person after the heart of God and all this stuff. And I'm like, I don't really know David. Like, I know King David a different King David. <laughs> I don't know if y'all know. I digress. But anyway, I just know a different King David, right, at that time. Now I know who, hello, how y'all doing? Y'all okay? All right. I ain't trying to, like, blast y'all. I just, I find it funny to mess with people, and y'all are gorgeous for the record. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Y'all see the shoes? Did you take pictures? Take my picture. Like, I keep telling y'all, like, I was picture deprived for many years. And so that's one of the things that happened during incarceration, right? Like, you don't really get to see yourself in a way that you're able to be represented in a way other than a monster, right? And I'm so much more. I'm probably the king of hugs, I think, just for the record. So anybody want to hug later? If you approve, right? No unapproved hugs, right? But... It's so funny. So anyway, I began to think about what is this language? Who is this King David, right? And then I began to read this thing called the Bible. And really, I digress because it's a different kind of, but I want to make this point is when I extracted from the scripture that there was a guidance, a guideline by which if I followed, I could begin to go through a process that's called transformation. And so there's a biblical text that says, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is the good and acceptable will of God. Listen, while that was buffering in my head, y'all have to understand, I was under the sentence of death. I was under, actually in the county jail, I was under capital arrest. So they were telling me, we're going to kill you. There's nothing redeemable about you. 
We have to exterminate you so that the earth will be safe. Because you're so horrible and the act that you commit is so unforgivable that the only justice can occur is we kill you. And I will be the first to say at the moment that was said, I was like, y'all, you know, y'all got a point. I'm a horrible person. I had no sense of my potential in that moment. All I could see, which what most people see in those dark moments of their life is that, man, I did something horrible and I'm not redeemable. So it took years for me to find my footing. And so I share with people today, yesterday, my bad decisions stood on my neck. Today, the humility of Ronaldo is the fact that I stand on my yesterday and say, listen, I'll never forget. So I'll continually walk in humility, but I'm better than my worst decision. And I want to echo that as many times as I can, because oftentimes we are made to believe that we live in a world of unforgiveness and harshness and white against black, black against white, and we get all into those things and those are real scenarios, Democrat against Republican, right? I have to tell y'all, this is central Illinois. I have an idea of what this space consists of, but here's what I know. I was sitting in a prison cell and I did not want to be judged by my outer appearance, by the acts that people pointed out about me. And so I never walk into a space judging anyone. What I do is walk into the space and say, I hope we get a chance to meet each other. And what we might find out is that we have things in common, even though we don't look alike, even though we don't have the same politics. But what if we walk in the same love? Because scripture teaches me perfect love cast away what? It's got to be one person in this room that know, huh? Perfect love casts away what? Fear. Say it loud. Fear. Fear. Perfect love casts away fear. The perfect love of Christ will allow me to walk in any space and not be frightened, right, by what someone else may say or do. Because I'm walking in the power of the moment, not in reflection of who's there. Because I believe that the power that I'm given is given through the knowledge of Christ, right? For he give you not the spirit of fear, but power, love, and what? Sound. What kind of mind? Sound. A sound mind. That's why y'all sitting up front like, hey, just for the record, I want to go on record as saying I'm starting the Ronaldo Hudson fan club today. <laughs> y'all laughing, I'm serious, right? So you want to sign up, holler at me. But it's important because you know what happens too often in life? We, will, we don't take the time to celebrate our lives. We don't take the time to celebrate the potential of connection. Because when I look in the, all of y'all different faces, I see the potential of something great. I see the potential that, man, what if I meet with this person and that person go and share with another person that, man, you know what, guess what? I was so inspired by the fact that you had every reason to be depressed, you had every reason to not trust anyone, but you chose to trust anyway. So I was telling y'all, so I lost my twin brother due to a horrible uh, incident at the age of six. At the age of 15, my brother, who's a year older than me, decided that he was going to kill my family. So he shot me in the chest with a 12-gauge shotgun. When I woke up in the hospital, a few weeks later, I discovered that he had killed my auntie, he had killed my little cousin and shot six other family members. And so when I did make it home to my family, I discovered that they were so broken. They were so, like today we talk about trauma and we talk about wraparound services. That wasn't the case in the 70s when this incident occurred. There was no wraparound services. There was no check-ins, right? And so when I went home, I was rejected by my family because I looked like my brother. I wasn't responsible for the act of my brother, but I was held responsible by everyone around me because I reminded them of who? My brother. And so that sent me on a 
world spin, and I began to chase a cure for the depression. And so I began to use drugs. So I was a teenage drug addict. And the thing that gave me peace of mind was PCP. And so I wanted to fantasize and not live in the real world. And so under the influence of PCP, I could walk around and see magical things. Y'all call them cartoons? Like, I would see these magical happy birds and life was wonderful under the illusion of peace. But it was only a illusion. It wasn't peace and it caused me to get, begin to fantasize to the extent that I saw a very poor, very vulnerable person who appeared to my broken mind, hallucinative mind, to be rich. And I took his life in pursuit of thinking I would be happy, that I would take the money and run away and be happy ever after. That wasn't the case. I took his life and the next day I was in prison. I woke up in a cell and was in a paper suit. I don't know if y'all ever seen some of y'all they have where they take your clothes and everything. I mean, it was just a horrible situation. And so I never gloss over it, but I also am important. It's important to me to remember that Mr. Folk Peterson, who was the victim of my offense, is a person that deserved honor. And one of the things that I learned about it was, any of y'all familiar with the movie A Few Good Men? You ever see the movie? There's a scene in that movie that really transformed my life, which was these two soldiers were put on trial for murder and they were, went to trial before a military court. And they were found innocent of murder because they were following instructions, right? But they were found guilty of conduct unbecoming of officers. And so the young white guy, it was a young white guy and a black guy, the young white guy asked the brother, since they found us innocent, can we go back because he loved the military. And the brother looked at him and said, man, no, we can't go back because the person that lost his life, we should have protected. He was vulnerable, he was weak, and we're trained to defend the weak, and we didn't do it. And I have to tell y'all, it was like a bomb went off in my heart and in my head because I remember in that moment that Mr. Peterson was vulnerable. Mr. Peterson should have been protected by me. And I didn't have the mental capacity to appreciate the criminality of my conduct or even to conform myself to the requirements of the law in that moment, but yet I was still responsible for that horrible act against him. And I knew that when that resonated with me, I would never ever be drunk, high, or violate a human right again. And from that moment to this moment, I've been walking this walk of hope. I've been walking through the transformational process because I'm determined by the time I decide, or the world, life, God, whatever, decide to lay me down, I will walk through the earth reminding people that good people can do bad things. And we have to make room for people to be redeemed. And so it's important to me to not gloss over those things, those horrible things, but it's also important for me to talk about the fact that the trauma that I experienced influenced my decisions. And I think too often under the dangerous one-sided narrative that my organization actually walks around the nation talking about is there's a whole story that oftentimes get glossed over. And people begin to identify people as the act that they committed, rather than them being the person that committed the act. I am not the act, I'm the person responsible for the act, which means I can be better. Does that make sense? And that's one of the reasons that I'm inspired to walk around, not to boast, even though, like, as y'all can see, like, I don't mind talking about how wonderful I look and how handsome I am, because I'm in a different uniform. 
I had to understand, like, like prison strips you out. And it doesn't really inspire the best of us. And so as an introducer, thank you, talked a little bit about the fact that during my incarceration, to back up a second, when I went to prison, I couldn't read or write. So they could have said to me, Ronaldo, spell R. I spell R? I couldn't. I couldn't spell. I was a grade school dropout. I left the, actually, when I talk about the sixth grade, when I was in the sixth grade, I actually was promoted to the sixth grade. I didn't graduate to the sixth grade. The fifth grade was trying to get rid of me because they didn't want me back. But the thing that sent me from school was that I had a teacher, and I'll never forget this teacher's name. His name was Mr. Politeer. And I love the teachers that are teachers. But this teacher humiliated me in such a way that I never went back to school. I was in a situation where I was smelling. And rather than this teacher taking me to the side and say, hey, young boy, no one taught you how to wash yourself. Come on, let me show you what you need to do. Instead of him doing that, he began to talk in the open classroom in front of everybody. There's someone in this room that smells really bad. And I began to shrink because I knew I could smell myself. Like, man, I hope he don't. You know, I began to shrink, and this teacher said, Ronaldo, come up here. And he pulled a towel and a bar of soap out of his drawer and said, go clean yourself up. You smell bad. And I walked out of that classroom and never walked into a school again. Well, until 2020, when I came home, I went back to that school because I knew not only could I read and write at that point, I knew that I needed to face that unaddressed harm. And I didn't have to address it to that person. I had to address, address it to that institution. And so I went to that school and I noticed something. It still looked the same. I'm like, man, this is why people fail because community, communities are neglected. And then when people fail, people blame it on the fact that, you know, they were bad rather than the institution was bad. And so I want to make sure I name that person, Mr. Politeer, like they name me when they talk about my crime, Ronaldo Hudson. Mr. Politeer was a teacher that didn't do right by a child, not by an adult. And that's important to all the teachers. No matter what, please respect and honor your students in a way that they'll mimic you rather than talk about you. Is that fair? Is that fair, y'all? All right, and so I don't, I don't mean to start preaching. So anyway, but I will. Yes, and I'll pass my head around. But <laughs> y'all, <laughs> I will. Like, in the name of Jesus, I'll send this boy around, see what come back. But <laughs> so in my process, right, I actually was convicted I went to trial and we filed a claim of not being not guilty by reason of insanity. And my first trial ended in a hung jury because when the jurors heard my story, four of them believed, you know what, there's no way this person, you know, uh, knew what they were doing. It's just the evidence is really clear that you were broken. You're responsible, but you were broken. And so, I ended up with a second trial, and my defense wasn't put on, and I was immediately put a uh, sentence to death. So I had spent seven years in the Cook County Jail through that process, and so I ended up going to Illinois' death row, right? That was in 1990, and so I was still struggling with who I, who I am, who I was, and I hadn't transformed in a sense where I was owning who I am, what I did to the extent that my behavior really manifest or witnessed or testified to that reality. But during that process, I ultimately got into an altercation on death row, which leads to stuff I already mentioned, but it's all connected. And after this altercation, I was put in what's called control seg. And this warden came to the cell 
and really read me to riot act, you know, about who I am, my responsibility to not act out. And I was like, man, Mr. White Man, like, come on, man, shut up. Like, they're going to kill me. I don't really care about what you think my responsibility is. He said, you're saying that, but let me tell you something, young man, that you don't never know what's going to happen. And you need to conduct yourself in a way that is responsible. And so what it did, it triggered something that I'm going to tell y'all, y'all better not laugh. On death row, we used to have, and I mean that, nobody can laugh at this story. When we was on death row, we used to have what's called death row parties, where 10 people could go to the rec room and they would have cakes and stuff we made, right? And so one day I went to the yard, none of my friends were on the yard. And I'm like, where is everybody? And so I went to the yard, did my little thing, and I came back, and my buddy was in the shower next door. I said, hey, man, where is everybody? He said, oh, it was so-and-so's birthday, Nardo. I'm like, okay, well, why y'all didn't uh, tell me? He said, ah, Nardo, I don't know how to break this to you. Don't nobody want to be around you, man. I said, hey, wait a minute. It's death row. <laughs> like, can you? How do you get disinvited to a death row party? Like, of all the parties you can be disinvited to, you gonna tell me that y'all have the nerve? Can y'all imagine Freddy Cougar, Michael Myers, Freddy Cougar, Michael Myers, Hannibal Lecter, who else? Chucky. Gonna sit up here and say, ah, Nardo, we don't wanna be around you. I was like, Dag, there is something majorly wrong with you when the worst of the worst of the worst, by perspective, because people can debate if they believe that or not, but this is the place where society has decided that this is the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst, right? And this is my dwelling place, and even they don't want me around? I'm like, maybe the state is for <laughs> true. But then I got exposed when I was in this cell also to this warden who called me on my stuff. And then he said to me, but I'll make you a challenge. He said, do you read the Bible? I said, he don't really know what he's talking about. Because I will tell y'all, I was previously a member of the Nation of Islam. And so I used to read the Bible simply to beat Christians up. Like, I'd be like, y'all don't read the Bible. I will whoop you like, you better not even try it. You don't know your Bible. You don't know Paul. You don't know. You don't. I know Genesis, from Genesis 1 to Revelations 22, 21. You don't want to mess with me. And so he said to me, I'll make a deal with you. He said, I visit death row once a week. He said, every Friday when I see you, if you quote a scripture to me, I'll take a day off of your segregation time. I said, sucker, <laughs> I got him. And so I was waiting on him. He said, oh, but there's a catch. He said, you can't act up during the course of the week before that. I said, oh, this dude's smart. <laughs> and then I said, okay. And I, I didn't do anything. I was waiting on him. When he came to the door that Friday, can anybody guess the scripture that I, I hit him with? You don't have to know. Anybody? No? Nope, I ain't give him that much, because that's a longer scripture. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only. Hello, somebody. That's right. I was on him. I was like, Jesus wept. <laughs> and I was like, got him. <laughs> and so I was so excited, but I got, ooh, you told you, Mr. White Man, you ain't smarter than me. And, and no offense to anyone that identifies as a white man, right? Because you're really not white. You're kind of like colored, too. Like, y'all just think y'all white, but that's another conversation. This is the color white. Anyway, I was like, I ain't going to start no trouble, like, because I still want to get out of Southern Illinois. But I was like, man, uh, Jesus wept. I was so proud. He looked at me and pulled out his little notebook. He said, very good. i like, I know, right? And then he said, but why? I said, oh, no, that wasn't a part of the deal. That wasn't part of the deal. You, you didn't say, I need to know why. 
when I, when I quote a scripture. He just, you just say quote a scripture. He said, yeah, I know, but I'm interested. See, what I didn't know at the time was that this warden was actually an evangelist. So he wasn't just a warden, he was an evangelist who was a warden. And he was evangelizing me when I thought I was manipulating him. And it went from not only me quoting scriptures to him every Friday, I began to tell the guys in segregation, hey, here come the warden, we're on the yard. And I would tell my buddies in segregation, here, you quote this scripture. Hey, and you quote this scripture, and you quote this scripture. And we turned, just by his investment in me, we turned the segregational unit of Pontiac Correctional Center into a little Bible study that was unexpected and people didn't understand what was happening behind the wall in one of the so-called worst places possible, which it was segregation on death row. So you kind of do the math for that. You're not just in prison. You're in prison that's in prison that is in death row unit. In that death row unit is a segregation unit, right? We began to turn that unit into the place that other people wanted to come and visit. Because the people that was there, that was supposed to be the worst of the worst, were beginning to talk about the best of life. And they began to talk about transformational processes because we started studying the scripture. And so I went back and studied, right, why did he weep? There's a text that says that Jesus looked out among the flock and he saw the sheep scattered without shepherd. And he said, I pray that you pray that the Lord of the harvest would send more har uh, laborers, for the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And so the space began to change. The atmosphere began to change because with the transformational process of the mind, the behavior began to change. When the behavior began to change, the behavior of staff began to get affected by the changing of the people that they were responsible for maintaining. And so we began to build out, and this led to my first program that I designed, which was called Men of Integrity While on Death Row. And actually the subtitle was Men of Integrity, but it was Unleash the Power Program. And Unleash the Power Program was, we were saying condemn people that care to care. We were condemned, but we chose to care while we waited for our death. And if people begin to go back and look at my story, one of the things that I say in a Tribune article is, my transformational process did not start or was not predicated around me thinking I would walk out of prison. My transformational process started because I was preparing to die. And I didn't want to be good for nothing. I wanted to be able to walk to my death and say, you know what, I did my best. I made bad decisions, but I did the best with the rest that I had left. But what I didn't know that it triggered so much more transformation. And as we begin to become more educated, and I begin to become more educated, I recognized that I was a power to be reckoned with. And so I began to walk in on death row as a free man. And I went from being one of the worst people there to a trustee. Can y'all imagine death row actually having people that had a death sentence walking around without handcuffs? That's, that was me. I'm one of the few people that was given that opportunity because of the transformational process was so apparent that like, man, we want people to see what this would look like. Little did I know as time began to move forward that the society and the nation will begin to talk about the death penalty. And there was a guy by the name of Anthony Porter, who was on death row, who was 48 hours for his execution. And his lawyers filed a motion because of his mental capacity. And there is a law that says, or the legislation that teaches or pushes that you can't uh, execute a mentally challenged person. And so they wanted to check his uh, tape test and test him to see what his mental capacity consisted of. While this was going on, he got a stay of execution. While this was going on, some students at Northwestern with a professor, if I remember correctly, David Protest, began 
to look at old cases. And because he was scheduled to be executed, they took this box and started processing through it. And they found a name with a phone number and an address. And they asked the professor, could they call this number? And they called this number, and the guy invited them to the house. And he confessed, think about this, to the actual crime that Anthony Porter was about to be executed for. Isn't that amazing? That led to the exoneration of this person that people was only, that they only didn't execute him was because they thought he wasn't able to mentally appreciate or be able to respond to what was actually occurring with respect to that, right? But God, and that's why I tell people, right? I, even me, I will confess this, even me, a person that was on death row, I was like, man, you know you did it. I mean, I'm just being honest because we are broken people and it's hard to see past your own pain. It's often hard to see past the stuff that you're struggling with. It's hard to see other people better than you. And so until you rise up to recognize, guess what? There are people better than you. There are people that will make better decisions than you, right? And everybody's not going to make the decision just because you'll make that decision. And I always try to remind myself of that constantly, right? Do not judge people around what you think you will do. Because what if they rise above you? You didn't give them room for that. So anyway, that is part of the process. So they ended up talking about the death penalty. They ended up calling a moratorium, Governor Ryan. Y'all, any of y'all remember Governor Ryan? Right, he ended up calling a moratorium against the death penalty. And as that process processed, on 2003, Governor Ryan commuted all death sentences. There was 167 people on Illinois' death row. I was one of them that was commuted by Governor Ryan, and my sentence was commuted from death to life without the possibility of parole. And so I actually, as y'all can see, I'm, I'm out. So something else happened, right? And that's when I tell people about the power of God, right? Is you cannot ever, ever, I don't care what anybody tell you, this is my humble opinion, I own this myself. You can never, ever think that you get to decide the grace of God. Because he decided, Governor Ryan decided on behalf of Ronaldo Hudson, you should never walk out. Governor Prisker said, Ronaldo, you stand as one of the most rehabilitated people in the state facilities. You have established programs that we have not even established. I stat, wrote and designed the program called the Building Block, and it's predicated around the incarcerated population using their knowledge and their experiences to rehabilitate themselves. We went from not having access to school to changing the day rooms and to classrooms. There were people in the cells that were mathematicians. Like, I know brothers that will walk some of the tightest students. They're just really smart, but they don't have access to stuff. And I tapped into all those resources. And I get most of the credit, I have to admit. I get the credit of all those people's brilliance. I just understood the power of community. And I can't say that enough. There's so much power when you pull community together and you tap into the resources of individuals and not just one person. Does that make sense? So moving right along like a herd of turtles. Y'all ever see the herd of turtles? Anybody, y'all familiar with herd of turtles? I tell people all the time, a herd of turtles, the only time you see turtles running is when they're hatched on the beach and they try to get to the water before they get eaten. <laughs> and so I be like, man, turtles can run. And so that's just so funny to me to learn those things and begin to share them. Because we begin to be, I think we're better as we're constantly being educated. And some of the things that may not seem that important now, you'll find as you get older, because I stand in that you know, window where I'm 58 years young. I know it's hard to believe, thank you. But, but I'm 58 years young, and I recognize, I think I got another 50 left in me, because I still got a lot of work to do, but I don't know. But that being said, I want to go around the world, not just the state of Illinois, and remind people that hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when it comes, it's like a tree of life. And I remind people every chance I get 
that the only reason I'm here is I believe it's my faith. I believe the scripture when it said, when I talked about David, if you turn from your wicked ways and your unrighteous thoughts, God said he'll show you the sure mercies of David and he will abundantly pardon you. I received another clemency. And some of you scholars that's here or journalists, right? I don't know how many people on the earth has received clemencies from two different governors. I have a clemency order from Governor Ryan, and I have another one from Governor Prisker. I call him Prisker the Fixer, right? And it's important to me to acknowledge the fact that you never know where grace will come from. And you may be the grace that someone needs. You know what I mean? And so we can't always look for everybody else to do what we should do for ourselves. And so I wake up, I, I really am, I tease, but I'm a very humble person. Is that humble even saying that? <laughs> I'm a very humble person, you know. <laughs> but I do believe that I try to walk in humility. I do, but I have a tremendous amount of confidence, I have to be honest. And one of the things that used to happen to me in prison was staff used to confuse my confidence with arrogance because I stopped believing that they were in charge of me. And I started walking through the place like they worked for me. And they didn't like that. But I used to remind the staff, like, y'all, my security detail. I don't know what y'all think. I'm going to be walking around mad. Don't y'all let nobody touch me. I have a future. <laughs> and they'd be telling us to line up. And I would just say, I'll line up, make sure my detail is close in case something happened. And they used to get mad at me because I began to recognize the power of incarceration is equally a part of perception. Right? As a man thinketh in his heart, so shall he be. And so I began to march through those spaces. And I'm not joking. I literally used to be marching. I would march down the walks, and they'd be like, what's wrong with him? The old man has finally went crazy. And I'm like, no, I didn't. i just been fully persuaded. I'm totally convinced that the word of God can never go out and come back void. And I chose to believe it, and I'm here, and I'm telling y'all, not because of how good I am. The goodness of God is not predicated on innocence. In fact, he died for the guilty. Hello? I don't know about y'all, but I'm grateful for that because I get to walk in that power. And I don't have to apologize to people because man will hold stuff against you for life. God will let it go. God will let it go. And when you recognize that, I recognize that. And so while I was waiting, in fact, I'll tell y'all really quickly, when my lawyer, who's also my boss right now, Jennifer Sobel, who is the director of the Illinois Prison Project, right, that's my direct supervisor, when she took my case on, I began to say to her, don't let me die in prison. She's like, man, what kind of pressure is that? Like, really? That's what you gonna come at me? I said, yeah, but don't let me die in prison. And I began to believe that I was gonna come home to such a degree that I gave away everything that was in the cell that I was in. I gave away my TV, my radio, my everything, and I kept my stuff nice. And I had one friend that was like, uh-oh, the old man didn't finally snap. And he was going around behind me telling people that I was giving stuff to, I'll be back to get that because the old man ain't going nowhere. He got life without the possibility of parole. Ain't nobody finna release him. But then I had a friend that me and this person used to talk constantly. And they told me one day, they said, Ronaldo, Governor Prisker has a purple pen with gold tips that has ink that when he pulls it out, it always say yes. I'm like, what in the, because I was like, okay. Cuckoo. <laughs> and every day we talk, at the end of our conversation, they would say, Ronaldo, guess what? I'm like, what? Governor Prisker has a purple pen with gold tips, and when he pulls it out, the ink always say yes. Three days later, guess what happened? They called my friend and said, we need an address. Governor Prisker just signed your clemency. You're going home. I said, uh-oh. And so they went home. And so my buddy, who I'm hoping and praying will be given grace, uh, I was having a conversation with him, and I said, hey, Green, that's his name. He said, yeah. 
I say, Governor Prisker has a purple pen <laughs> with gold tips. And when he pulls it out, it always say yes. And I started walking in that. And then I put on this song, Jason Nelson, y'all familiar with Atmosphere? Any of y'all familiar with that song? The Atmosphere, I began to play that song like every day, changing the atmosphere. Shift it, come on, come on, see? Come on, shift in the atmosphere, thank you. But I began to play that song every day, even tried to sing some of it. Uh, like, <laughs> don't make no, anyway, I always wanted to be a singer. But I began to play that song. And as I started to play that song, what I learned was that there is a shifting. There is a confidence that comes with when you really get into that space where you recognize that there's a grace that comes from having faith. It is impossible to please God without faith. For those that come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek his face. I said, ooh, that's good. And so I started giving my stuff away. And so... I was like, man, and my buddy, I'm telling you, he's, he's actually in the halfway house. He went around to all the guys' sales that I gave stuff to. He's like, I'll be to get that, so don't get too used to it. And I said, leave him alone. Well, it was this one day I, was, I had a really bad headache, and I didn't want to be bothered with anyone, and they kept calling me on the intercom. Hudson, the warden wanted to see you. I'm like, I don't want to talk to the warden. They all finna do is try to make me open another wing, the building block program that I started. I'm like, I'm, uh, nope, I don't, I don't want to be bothered with y'all. And so finally, the sergeant came to the wing and said, Hudson, maybe you didn't hear it on the intercom, but the warden said, get to the gym now. I'm like, first of all, I ain't scared of you, and I ain't scared of the warden. I don't have to do nothing you say, because <laughs> I was having a really bad headache, and I just wanted to sleep. Tell the warden, I want to talk to them. They said, man, stop playing. I'm like, all right. So I go to the gym, walked to the gym, the warden began to talk to me about another building block wing that we want to open. I'm like, and I knew it. I've been voluntold. Like, I ain't, I ain't volunteering. I'm being voluntold. I'm like, ah, oh, man, okay. And so the warden said to me, hey, man, you don't want to do what you've been gifted to do. I'm like, all right. And she so said, you know what? Let's go to the uh, clinical services because it's air conditioned in there. And so we go to the clinical services, and she moves, say, sit there. She walks across, and she picks up a phone, and she put the phone on the desk and pick it up and hit a number and say, go for Hudson. I said, er, what the? I ain't never experienced that before. And so she said, oh, one of the deputy directors want to talk to you, Ronaldo. I said, wow, OK. Somebody else want to just rip some just genius up out of me. I know what that is. <laughs> they, do, they do. That's not like they just want to just just use me. And so I said hello, and it was one of the most powerful voices that I've ever heard. It was the voice of Jennifer Sobel, my lawyer. She said, "Ronaldo, the governor just granted your clemency. You're about to be released." immediately. I was stumped. And I don't know if y'all noticed this about me. I, will, I can talk to anyone. I can wake up and talk to a cockroach for 12 hours. Like, I, am a t I was stumped. And I realized in a moment that I carried so much weight and guilt and shame that instantly it was removed. And I felt like I can fly. I believe I can fly. I believe I can fly. I felt that for real. And I was like, I think about it every night and day. Spread my wings and fly away. I believe I can soar. See me running through that open door. I was like, yeah, I get to run through the open door. But then guess what happened? The clock start ticking, and I'm like, hey, wait a minute. Ain't nothing happening. Why haven't I been released? Yesterday came back. Back in my day of foolishness, I committed an offense. I was taken to court and found guilty for an assault back in the 90s. 
And they said, you didn't get clemency on that case. You got clemency on this case. You owe the Illinois Department of Correction another two and a half years. Can somebody say, but God? I'm telling y'all, I was like, wait a minute. Like, wait a minute here, Lord. Like, you didn't get me this excited. And I'm like, man, I got to walk around and the staff began to laugh at me. Peers began to laugh at me. And there was something put on my spirit to say, hope, peace, be still. Don't react to this moment because it's a lie. And it is the last hurdle you have to overcome. And so I shut up to only to this extent until I got to the phone. And when I got to the phone, I called my lawyer and said, hey. And she said, we're already on it. We got win. The order had stopped divine grace before it was even processed. And the order went back to the governor's office. And I went home two days later. Because God, when God declares something, the word of God will never go out and come back void. I had to wait for a couple more days. Yeah, you can clap today because that's real. Because see, there are people that are struggling with seeing their tomorrow be better. And you need to know that you need to just hold on. Just hold on, right? If I can go from death row to the front door as a guilty man, and now go from being called inmate to director, right? I'm also on some boards, like, right? I'm like, hello, I'm, I was in a meeting the other day, like, I was like, yes, yeah, so I think, you know, because you have to look all sophisticated, you know. I think the problem consists of, uh, I don't know, <laughs> so, but I get to do that now. And the thing, and the reason I take such pride in it is because I remember how many people said, you'll never walk out. In fact, I got a chance, I was telling the brother earlier, I got a chance to tell one of my friends when I was in a prison, he, I was the chaplain clerk. And so he would every come every Tuesday, I'm gonna say his name, Pastor Miller Danville. Pastor Miller Danville. Pastor Miller in Danville, y'all can email him, say, no, I don't see it. But look, he used to use me in his sermons and he used to tell the brothers, you brothers all need to be praising God because y'all all have outdates. But look over there. I'm like, for real, man? <laughs> Mr. Hudson has life without the possibility of parole and he'll never walk home, he'll never leave. And I used to do this. And he'll go through his, he said, yes, Hudson. I said, do you have God's personal DM? Because my Bible says, that if I have the faith the grain of a mustard seed, I can say to a mountain, get up and be removed, and nothing shall be impossible to me. So how could your word be more powerful than the word, sir, with all due respect? Because you have to give, you know, people their respect, right? He said, yeah, okay, uh, anyway, and he'll go through a sermon. Guess what happened? I walked into his church, and I told two young people that were sitting in the front row, come here and stand by me, and look at him. Keep both eyes on him in case he get a little loose. Because don't y'all listen to him anymore. Because he told me I would never walk out the door. Which means I can't listen to you, Pastor. Because you're not hearing from God. With respect to it coming to me. And that's my friend, I want to be clear. Because I get to tease him now. But it wasn't his responsibility to have faith for me. And that's where people get lost. It's your responsibility to have faith for you. Don't look at my inspiration as your inspiration. I'm a possibility and a glimpse to you looking at what is so down in you. Who's mining out of you? The greatness that exists in you. And there's a greatness that exists in every one of us. There's not one person in this space, in my humble opinion, walking this earth that doesn't have a tremendous amount of potential it's just untapped. And when I tapped into my potential, guess what happened? Don't make me do it. I began to make history. And now I'm a physical manifestation of hope. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when it comes like a tree of life, I want to open up for questions because I can talk for three days. I have a lot of stories. But I do want to make room 
Sister, did you want to have someone have the mics? Because I don't have a clock in front of me, but I know I've been running my mouth. I will say this to be clear to everyone. You cannot ask a question to me that I think is too much. You, I don't think you can embarrass me because a part of incarceration consists of being stripped out. Thank you. That is a really good question. And just to start, personal integrity to me is you being the message that you bring, being a principle-centered person. Principles never change, no matter what happens, no matter who you're in the space with. Hey, I knew something was special about this section over here. I was trying to figure it out. Then I saw a dude over here like looking like, uh, yeah, I'm talking about you, man. <laughs> What's your name? Sean. Hello, Sean. What? No, hold up. Before you start, I'll get back to it because I want to address, with all due respect, I know you, that's why they gave me a mic, right? But real, real talk, because there is a, a question that she asked that I really want to address really quick, and then I'll, go, I'll come to your question. Integrity really is principle. And the question you have to ask is, what, what are the principles that you live by? Because one of the things I notice with people generally is not just youth. Because I'm not an ageist. I don't care about how old you are. I care about how conscious you are. And to me, the change that I want to see in society is going to come from this group. Because as you get older, there's a Greek expression, old men for counsel, young men for war. And oftentimes what happens is we don't make space because we don't like each other, because we don't even know each other. And so to me, what I've learned Right? Like within the Building Block program, we had a group called the Youth Think Tank. And the Youth Think Tank was consisted of young men right, that controlled that space that I didn't allow any of the older heads, the OGs as they used to call us, right? They, didn't, they weren't allowed to come into that space. And any problem that we had in the unit or in the joint, I would give it to them and say, hey, how would y'all fix this? And what I discovered was they were better at fixing problems than all the old cats that can stand up and talk until you turn, you know, blue in the face, right? So integrity to me, sis, is being the message that you bring, that if you wake me up at any time of the day, I am the same person. I am principle-centered in which I have principles that say this, I don't care about your melon or lack thereof, I care about the conditions of the heart. Right? For from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak. And so the heart that I think about is the mind that can be transformed. And transformed minds come through principle-centered ideas and concepts. But I want to hear what you want to say, brother, because I... I ain't going to... It might Oh, you wanted to help a brother. Sean. Don't play with me, man. Like, you know, like this is... The, this is so in my lane, dude. Don't do that, dude. Like, let me tell you what I didn't tell you, right? No, I ain't gonna do that. I digress. Thank you for telling me don't help me to tuck my shoestring. I will do that. Y'all, that's Sean is the leader over here. <laughs> Who the leader over here? Hold on one second. Who the leader? Huh? You send a phone because maybe you the group don't want you? Who? This is? Which one? Why are you the boss? Everybody answer to like the whole group? So who, why do you, who? You say you're a leader, right?
Come on. All right, let's clap for that. Like, that is power. That is power because, ch listen, what's your name? Kalia, like, I really salute you for what you just shared because that was a power statement and I want to see that. I want to see that manifest, not just for you all, but for me and everyone I come in contact with, right? So thank you for sharing that. Any other questions over here? Hey, leader. Yo. Hey, Chris. Yo. Why are you a leader? What do they follow you? What do you mean, like, follow you what? Okay, now I don't want to do that. Okay, look, stay with me a second, right? Here's what I, oh, whoa! What's happening here? All right, peace. I thought the youth was starting to scare y'all, like, like, we are out of here, it's about to be a riot. Like, I'm running with y'all, <laughs> like. Okay, but listen, here's the reason I came over in this section. One of the things that happened to me is that I was ignored when I really needed someone to hear me, not just to preach to me. And I promise y'all, I'm not over here trying to preach to y'all. I really want to try to hear y'all because as I think about designing programs, what I'm discovering is that oftentimes people create what they think they need and they don't talk to the people that they're trying to reach. And so when you say I make money, like, you know, that's a good thing, but do you make real money? Do you make legitimate money? Do you make stuff that you can not have to hide, right? Because I get that, right? We live in a country that is designed around bootlegging, et cetera, right? But, you know, do you understand economics? Do you understand the importance of education and being someone with money with education who can retain that money and build generational wealth? And so I just want you to think about that type of stuff as you move forward, all right? Yes, sir. I, <laughs> the sixth grade. Huh? The streets. I was in the streets, yeah, for, in Chicago. No, my family was messed up, man. They was broken. Like, my family was street people. You know, drug dealers that, that wasn't really like, they weren't major drug dealers, they just dealt with drugs. And a lot of times people say that they're in the life and like don't tell the whole story. Most people that's in the drug life are petty, have petty, they make little money, they don't make real money, right? You're peons, right? They were peons, they couldn't afford their own lives, so they definitely couldn't afford to maintain mine or take care of my drug habits. So I had to do what I was doing on my own. So I was a homeless teenager that people don't even really think about that. When they think of homelessness, most people think about old people under, living under the Vilocks and stuff. And there's such a population of young people that are also homeless and running from friend house to friend house, et cetera. And so those are real uh, issues. But anyway, so to be clear, when I went to prison, I, ha I didn't have a GED or any of that. When I walked out, I walked out with a Bachelor of Divinity, right? And all the certificates that they had available because I understood that I wanted to have every tool to succeed because I knew that I was going to be successful, but I knew, I, had to, I knew that I had to prepare to be successful. Yeah. Hello. No, that is actually, I've been home two years and that's still an ongoing uh, investigation, to be honest. I'm still exploring to figure out like, like what happened and why there is no record that reflects his, even ex his existence. Because it's really, it's really a mystery that uh, I don't have answers to. Yes. That, um, you are truly a walking testimony of the power of God. Thank you. And um, you're walking in your destiny. It looks good on you. And um, Jesus wept because Lazarus died. But the reason why he really wept was because Mary and Martha, or should I say, Mary didn't know who he was. And he was there, he was the one that was creating all the miracles all over the place, and you are a walking miracle. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yo.
STD. Stop, think, and decide. Like, I'm serious. Like, stop, think, and decide. Like, people can, like, think that that's simplistic, but I've learned that it's the simple things that get you through, and people want everything to be really complicated. Every decision you make builds to something. And so I think when we're younger, we have the tendency to think we're invincible. And that stuff, you know, that, I just did it. And we're more impulsive. We don't really think about the consequences. And so I suffered 37 years of incarceration because I could not control my impulses or my uh, actions in a way that was reflective of wanting a better life for myself. And so, like, everyone, especially in this space right now, like, you're old enough to think every decision you make, social media, all that stuff can be used against you. They use it against people uh, in the workspaces now. So even thinking about, like, I was talking with my niece. I have a 17-year-old niece, and she does TikTok, and I watch to make sure. I'm like, hey, okay, that's cool, and you dancing and all the cool stuff. But, babe, remember that that stuff can come back. And it's cute right now, but it is not cute at 40. You know, and so please uh, think about it. Stop thinking this out. Yes. No, that is a very good question as well. Because if you don't know, somebody else will control you, right? And so, like, people oftentimes have to lean on other people because of what they don't know, right? Like, when I talked about, bro, I make money, I'm like, okay, I make money now, but I also understand the importance of investment, right? I understand the importance of savings. I understand the importance of credit, like, scores. I understand, like, for example, I was absent for 37 years. And so when I went to rent a apartment, I did not have any history of credit. And so I thought simply understanding, you know, I got a, a credit card, right? And didn't know that I didn't have a credit history. Like when you're talking about making money, period, right? What do you do with it? How do you justify it? Like we live in a country where, like from a biblical text, they said, render unto Caesar which is Caesar, and then render unto God which is God. And that text was talking about specifically taxes because the, the question was asked of Jesus about do we pay Caesar taxes? Right? And so if you're going to have money, then you need to understand the tax game. You need to understand, right, if you want to be educated, if you want to be a professor, then you need to qualify to be in this space, right? Because they don't just let no anybody walk in a room and begin to pull into people's lives. And so when people, like, minimize those things, it's more an, a, 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 an indicator of their lack of knowledge of the importance of progress. And I'm even learning, like, right now, I'm about to go back to school to get my master's so that I can start working on my PhD. Because what I have decided was that I have access to some, to some amazing spaces right now, and I make a pretty decent living, right? But I recognize, no, I'm decent, I'm straight, right? But what I discovered, though, is there's a different tax bracket that follow those letters. It just is. Right? And so people need to understand the truth about that. That's just not a status, right? It's a qualifier to say, excuse me, I am demanding this because of, you need to check out my pedigree, right? I have the ability to teach, you, you know what I mean, the following, because I learned this stuff and so I can now teach it. And so education is extremely important, in my humble opinion. But there's different forms of education. Like, I am a very streetwise knowledgeable person, right? I have a PhD in incarceration. Like, I can't imagine a question about incarceration that I can't answer, because I went through the whole process. Not only did I, like, from the county jail experience, seven years, from 1983 to 1990, from death row, from 1990 to 2003, from 2003 to 2020, I was in the general population with life without the possibility of parole. And through that process, I recognized I had to requalify myself. 
and not allow the peer pressure, because believe it or not, even in prison, peer pressure exists. And imagine people trying to pressure me into continually acting like an idiot. I had to resist that. And one of the struggles that I've noticed with young people is the inability to resist peer pressure. And that's an area that I definitely want to develop uh, more illustrations on. In fact, in the city, I'm getting ready to start what I call my love circles. You now people talk about restorative justice. I'm a practitioner, right? I'm a certified practitioner of restorative justice. But I'm more convinced that people need to learn the lesson of love and then process to those other uh, degrees of success in life. Talk to me. Yes? I would say, to, and not just to the youth, to anybody, you can't fear what others, you know, like you have to decide what you want for you. Because every one of us, we tend, we can even lay next to 100 people, but when we close our eyes, I can't outrun the hell between my ears. And so for me, what I discovered was that all the trouble that existed in my life started with the hell between my ears. And so I would say to everyone, what type of stuff is buffering between your ears? And you have to decide how to unplug or plug into what you want to be repeated out of you. Like what you want the world to see about you, right? Because I get image, like I went through that for a lot of years. I get, you know what I mean, status. I have status, right? I left gang life not because I simply qualified to retire. I left the life because I recognized that there were irreconcilable differences. I divorced that life. I didn't retire from that life because I didn't want to be continually responsible for the actions of people that's choosing not to be responsible. And so that is a choice that every person must make. Choose ye this day who you will serve. And it's so easy to get caught up in that space, but I say to people, grace come by you being courageous and saying, Y'all can laugh all y'all want. Like, people laughed at me when I started walking away from stuff inside prison. Now they call me, asking me for help. You have to decide for yourself and not be afraid. Because I even had staff used to laugh at me. You used to be so tough. Look at you now. You a punk now. <laughs> I was like, yeah, whatever, right? But I have a better sense of who I am. And I walk in peace. Like, you go home every day and you frustrated. And I used to remind them, like, you getting mad at me because I got more peace than you and you going home. Now they really bothered because they see me on social media and I be talking crazy. Well, the life that I live is so wonderful, right? And I'm serious because people need to be reminded that there's a tremendous amount of grace and power and benefit for doing the right thing. Because we've been made to believe that the only people that succeed is the people that's doing the wrong thing. And that's a lie from hell. Okay, we have time for one more question. Yo. Man, with the opportunity, you can be my boss. I mean, the reality, if you have to understand, like you can look at people and be like, because I wasn't educated, right, other people spoke for me. And with education and opportunities, you begin to get access, right, in a way in which people that's not educated just don't. They just don't. And so when the opportunity presents itself, I'm saying step in it and get all that you can, glean every possible, in fact, Here's the rub. If, you have, if you're not challenging your, your teacher's intellect, then you're not really present. Make your teacher have to go back and go to school. 
then you're doing your job. Like start asking, hard, like the, the art of school to me is asking questions constantly. You want to constantly ask questions because that's how you build out things. It's asking questions that can get answered and if no one can answer the question, that might be your business. That's how people succeed in life. Because they say, ah, I can answer a question that no one else was able to answer. That's why they, you know, I go all around, I'm like, oh, I can say stuff no one else but me can talk about. And it makes room for me, it makes way for me. And so I would say that if you have access to education, then make every moment of it work for you, rather than looking at it as a labor and a task, right? Because I think that's what people run into the struggle is they begin to look at education and the responsibility that comes with being a student as a task rather than a part of the process of success. There's no really successful people without process. I don't care if you look at Michael Jordan, right? They got this thing called rehearsal. Practice, practice. I practice speaking, believe it or not, right? I know I, I, I'm good, but I watch TED Talks. I do. Like, I watch every video that I ever do. It's like, ooh, I can't believe you said that, man. That was so... How did you get lost right there, right? Start putting your scripts in front of you. Like, like I'm learning constantly. I've learned from today, even though from that section, the youngsters, young people, no disrespect, right? Because y'all look kind of tough. <laughs> I'd be like, man, they beat you up in Southern Illinois. And I'd be thinking about stuff. I'm just teasing with them, like, because here's the thing that I believe that people oftentimes forget. That's where the power is. That's where all the real influence come, from that section of society. They just don't get that as you get older, you get in control of all the purse strings. <laughs> and it's education that give you access to do that combination. But oftentimes, those of us that are older are getting paid off of their brilliance, because they haven't walked into the knowledge of saying, hey, wait a minute, I can have a PhD. I was at an event yesterday, and this young lady that's 32, has two masters and a PhD, and killing it, right? And so she's professor, doctor, <laughs> right? And a young person. And she walking in, in every space she walk in, they honoring her. And so it's not so much to say, okay, them people gave me, no, you earned it. That's the thing that I remember when they gave me my uh, uh, Bachelor of Divinity. Like, I earned this, you didn't give me that. I put the work in, right? And so, I think that if people, like, like I want to teach, to be honest, I want to teach some courses. And so I'm thinking about how to qualify, right? Because you can be the most experienced person in the world, but you don't qualify, you don't hit them dots, right? And so education is vitally important if you ask me. It doesn't define you, but it definitely qualify you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ronaldo. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I want to say thank you hey, to for, everyone who came and the incarceration class here at Heartland. Thank you for helping promote this, especially with the great help of our wonderful teacher. And thank you, Ronaldo, for coming. It thank helped you. a lot. Thank hey, you. can I? Like